Hey, so hi everyone. Um, today we're going to talk about um, the No Wrong Door Network sustainment programme um, with a little bit of context around how it all started and where it started from. Um, so we've called the presentation um, Navigating Systems a Better Approach to Working Together because in this presentation, but also throughout the two, um, two programmes I'm going to talk to you about today, um, we it was all about embedding a better practice in order to work more collaboratively together as a network. Um, so I'm going to um, start now. So um, basically what we've got is we're going to talk a little bit about the Navigator service and its outcomes and the learning from that um, from that service. Um, because that's what led us into doing the No Wrong Door Network Sustainment Program, which I'll then outline. Then I'm going to talk to you to specifically about sustainment and building sustainment into your contracts. And then um, some of the challenges and key learning that came out of the No Wrong Door Network Sustainment Program. And then some recommendations and the legacy of the program. Um, if anyone's got any questions as we go through, just pop them in the chat and I'm going to say them, I'm going to answer them as best as I can at the end. Um, if you ask them during, I might go way off topic and we won't ever finish. So I think that's a better way around of doing it. If you've got anything burning though, feel free to like ask me, but be, be warned. Um, okay, so um, the No Wrong Door Navigator Service. So um, this was, um, Yanni, are you doing this one? Is this me? This is me still. Um, so the No Wrong Door Navigator service um, was intended to support clients who've got multiple complex needs. So the multiple complex needs are classed as offending, mental health issues, substance misuse problems and homelessness or housing issues. Um, and the idea was to offer in the moment support. So taking people to the service that they needed to be at the time when they needed to go there. Um, and it was a way of sort of overcoming any anxieties people might have about going somewhere new or meeting new people or engaging in services of any kind. Um, and the clients were primarily um, referred to us through the No, no Wrong Door member organisations, um, which Jan is going to talk a little bit about on now for you. So. Cheers, Emma. Um, I'm Jan, Jan Pushout, the Learning and Evaluation Coordinator. So I'll just give a little bit of um, little bit of background and context. So in 2016, we got an independent evaluation of, of the No Wrong Door approach, No Wrong Door Network, as it was at that time. Um, and what we found is that although we'd created this network of, I think it was about 16 sort of like-minded organisations, um, sort of had, who had a shared approach, shared vision, shared goals, the review still, say, still found some um, underlying issues that we hadn't been able to resolve simply by making this no wrong door um, network of organisations. So what we found was that clients were still going to the wrong place. Um, so something clearly wasn't working regarding sort of communication between organisations, information sharing, whatever, um, and simply being redirected by the wrong door for want of a better word to the right door wasn't always enough for the client so they weren't being turned away as such so there wasn't a wrong door anymore which was great but they weren't necessarily making it to the agency that was suitable for them so obviously a problem um yeah having a no wrong door approach also obviously didn't mean that waiting times were, were magically reduced and the all the issues that came with long waiting times so they remained this obviously knock on effect meant that opportunities for engagement were still being missed. You know, those golden windows of opportunity still weren't being picked up as well as we would have hoped with this no wrong door network of like-minded organizations. And ultimately what we found then is that clients were still falling through the gaps, even though we thought through doing this no wrong door network, um, we thought we'd really minimize those gaps to a tiny, tiny level, but we found that, yeah, um, clients were still somehow falling through them and that a piece of evaluation that we did in 2016 recommended a navigator service basically a no wrong door specific navigator service to support people to access the right services whilst at a strategic level you know we were making those changes across the network at sort of an organizational systems change level but whilst that was happening we needed 
um, some specialists to come in just to make sure that the clients were still being able to navigate through the services at that point. So, Emma, if you could flick on to the next one, thanks. So when the Navigator role came into being, um, and, we, and it had been sort of up and running for a while, we did some further research. So we spoke to commissioners, we spoke to, to management, frontline staff, and of course, clients themselves, to get into the ribs of, of the issues of what, what wasn't quite working with No Wrong Door in its current guise, what, what it wasn't really offering. So I'm just going to give a really brief sort of overview, and then we'll go into the, in, in, into the more interesting stuff. But the strict eligibility criteria was complicating referral processes, organisations um, lacking any flexibility. So Navigate is telling us that relationship building absolutely key between multiple agencies um, and there was limited uh, evidence of that happening within the No Wrong Door network. Simply having that group of organisations wasn't enough. Um, again, as I mentioned previously, the large, the large um, caseloads and long waiting lists made it difficult to support to contact staff. So again, communicating with that client, absolutely crucial, something the navigators were able to do. Checking in with them constantly, attending appointments with clients was a real major step in the right direction. Simply signposting between the no wrong door organizations just, just wasn't enough. Real basic stuff like unclear information from organizations making it difficult to refer and really, really work properly in partnerships. Um, even when we got no wrong door up and running, there was only 16 organisations, staff were still telling us they didn't know who was in no wrong door, what information was out there for them. So how was a client ever going to know that? So again, um, the navigator is telling us about relationship building between agency staff, absolutely critical. And again, we had when we spoke to a lot of clients, um, we still had some feedback regarding unfriendly staff, um, jargon being used historic fear of professionals. Um, so the navigators having to work in work with clients to rebuild trust. And obviously, as you know, not all agencies are solely focused on multiple disadvantage or multiple complex needs. So there's a real wide variation in um, staff knowledge about how to deal with that, with those sort of clients. So having experience of that client group um, really helped. So, so basically until we, until we sort of embedded change at a sort of systemic level, the navigators really were still required to support those clients within No Wrong Door and, and, and ensure they got the best standards as possible. Um, I'll put the full navigator review from our website into the chat in the next couple of minutes, just so you can have a look. And it goes into a lot more detail about all the interviews with clients and support staff, which is probably quite interesting. But um, I'll pass back over now to Emma to talk a bit more about the achievements and sort of how we embed that learning into organisations to try to ensure that that learning has remained. So yeah, thanks, Emma. Oops. Oh, there's a slide missing. Okay. Um. So um. With that, all of that in mind, um. All the learning that we picked up from um running the Navigator service. Um. So that ran from two thousand and eighteen um to 2021 um and the service um worked with people um who had a variety of amounts of different needs um there was 62 percent who had three and four needs and 38 percent who had just two needs um so that gives you some sort of idea of the complexity of the clients that we were working with and we would work to join up all the services um, and make sure that they had took a collaborative approach to um, working with that client and to to working with each other really. Um, and when we were, when we were sort of doing that work, um, we sort of learn a lot about how to best work with clients who've got multiple complex needs and we enjoyed some really really good outcomes um, with our clients um, 92 percent of clients um, had a successful or positive outcome with the navigator service um, so when that service was due to come to an end obviously people were quite worried about the prospect of losing all of that learning and what would happen with all of that best practice. So um, we decided in con collaboration with Birmingham Changing Futures and Shelter um, to try and embed the, be the best practice that we picked up through doing the No Wrong Door Navigator service into something called the No Wrong Door Network Sustainment Programme. Okay, so the No Wrong Door Network Sustainment Programme um, is, oh, they've, 
she's mixed up these two slides so that's what i was talking about a second ago 92 percent positive outcomes um so the no wrong door network sustainment program um is comprised of three members of the former navigator service so myself the team leader emma brown which i should have said at the beginning of this presentation um and two navigators who then became um involvement officers um, and the idea was to embed the knowledge um, that we'd found from the Navigator service into the No Wrong Door network and beyond if possible, and um, thereby improving outcomes for people who've got multiple um, disadvantage or multiple complex needs um, by helping the services to work more collaboratively with each other. Um, and to do that, we wanted to take a really joined up approach to working with clients. Um, and bridge the gap, meaning that they wouldn't fall through the network or fall through the sort of gaps in support. Um, and um, the way that we tr tried to do that, um, we had three key work streams that we sort of devised whilst in the Navigator service and then sort of embellished and um, developed whilst um, we're in sort of mobility phase of this programme. So we came up with network and sharing best practice as a really important um, a facet of the work that we were doing. So um, the involvement officers were really sort of key to um, to developing these sessions. And what they decided would be the best approach was to have let's talk sessions. So I really wanted the um, the involvement officers to take the lead on this. They're frontline workers themselves, coming from a frontline um, worker background, and um, I wanted to know what would best engage them in um, being able to talk openly and freely about the challenges that they face in their roles, but also to share best practice and meet their peers and um, sort of problem solve around any difficult cases, obviously anonymized, um, with sort of a team approach um, from all the different departments and all the different services involved in the No Wrong Door Network. So um, they came up with Let's Talk sessions. And the idea was that nobody who manages anybody was allowed to go to the sessions. It was only frontline staff. Um, and that was with the idea in mind that we wanted people to be able to be really transparent and quite confident that it wasn't going to affect their job role if they brought up anything that was sort of questionable or challenging them in the workplace. We wanted them to speak freely and to share their ideas without fear of judgment from a, a senior worker or somebody in their um, team. Um, and we just really wanted them to have the chance to network with one another and um, really build those relationships across the different services because throughout our time as navigators, it was really key to getting people in um, to the right service. If you knew somebody in that service and had like a good relationship or good rapport, and professional relationship with the person in the other service, you were much more likely to know exactly where to send them and to sort of um, speed up that referral process. So we felt that that was really key to taking that joined up approach to develop those relationships across the different services. Um, and it wasn't being done. Um, so it was being done in an ad hoc kind of way, you know, you'd meet someone at a, um, at a workshop or you'd meet somebody at some training or um, at a MARAC meeting or something like that, and you make build a relationship with them there. But there was no sort of forums regularly taking place that would allow that kind of interaction. So, um, so let's talk sessions um, run fortnightly and therefore frontline staff only with all of that um, being embedded and all um, and each each session takes a um, different topic, something it can be something that's came out of um, of evaluations that have happened previously, like a gap in knowledge that people were talking about, um, or it could be something that's really sort of timely and of the moment that everybody's talking about. So um, a lot of people were bringing to the Let's Talk session problems that they were having with exempt accommodation. Um, and it was quite a hot topic. So um, we invited someone from Shelter ASG services to talk about exempt accommodation, kind of lead and facilitate that discussion. Um, so um, we left some flexibility in there for the Let's Talk sessions to be kind of reactive and timely, but also to try and fill in any gaps and just talk loosely around some sort of topic, sharing best practice, and then any tips or ideas that came out of that session was then typed up into like a mini summary and sent to all frontline workers. So it didn't matter if you'd attended the session or not, you would still get eyes on best practice tips and sort of tricks of the trade. Um, 
The next um, sort of line of work that we focused on was upskilling support services and addressing gaps in knowledge. So these were really focused on multiple disadvantaged workshops. So the idea was that instead of just having a um, a really good in-depth knowledge on your own specialism, for example, shelters, housing, and so they've got a really good knowledge around housing, um, and um, Birmingham Mind is mental health, so they've got a great knowledge around mental health. The idea was that anybody working with multiple complex needs um, clients should have a basic level, sort of a foundation level of knowledge around all four needs, not just the ones they specialise in. Um, so we did four workshops on one on each of the needs and um, really very basic um, level knowledge, really very practical things around how the different needs might impact somebody's ability to engage or maintain that engagement in whatever service you're working from um, to give people an idea of how better to work with people who've got multiple disadvantage. Um, and then um, also one workshop just on overarching um, on, all, on what it's like to work with somebody who's got multiple complex needs or multiple disadvantage. So I'm using those terms interchangeably because it's it's sort of um, not been 100% decided which terms are going to be used at the moment. Um, so um, with um, somebody who's got multiple disadvantage, you need to work with them in a slightly different way because obviously they've got lots of different services involved, lots of um, key players helping to support them. So it was really important that um, people got an understanding of why it's different to working with somebody who's just got the one need that they're getting support for. Um, and so um, that's what the multiple disadvantage workshop focuses on. It's sort of an overview of working with people who've got lots of different needs. Um, and then lastly, um, and oh, they were delivered to operational leads to embed in their teams. Um, I'll come on to that more when I talk about the sustainment aspects of the programme specifically. Um, the collaborative approach, which is the last sort of area that we really wanted to focus on in the programme, um, was about upskilling the network to carry out multiple multi agency meetings so the idea was that anybody who's what we found as navigators was that um if we had if we called a meeting with all those key players in the early stages of that person's referral um and got everyone around a table to talk about who was going to do what and um which what's what pieces of work the service was able to do and was willing to do and sort of all openly take accountability for different areas of the work um it it led to a much more sort of streamlined journey for that client the client had all their needs met because everybody was responsible for um their own piece of work and it stopped duplication of work um or sort of redu massively reduced that risk because um everybody knew who was doing what it also led to more accountability because everyone had openly agreed to what they would be doing. Um, and it also kind of made staff feel more confident about the work that they were doing. Um, often as a team leader, and I'm sure many of you, if you're team leaders or um, service managers will have experienced having um, someone come to you, you've given them a referral and they're like, oh my God, this person's really risky. Um, they've got loads of different needs. I don't know where to start with this person. Oh, can't you give them to someone else? I've got a really high caseload at the moment. And the whole idea with the um, network is that you're only doing your bread and butter job. So if you are a DV worker, you should only be focusing on the DV aspects of that client's case. If you're a substance misuse worker, you should only be concerning yourself with getting them into recovery or into a program or whatever it is that they've asked for. Um, and if you are confident that those other pieces of work are being done by some the right person, then it kind of relieves that worker of the stress and burden of carrying all that risk alone. So the multi-agency meetings were really important, not just for the clients to ensure that they were getting a fully wraparound and collaborative sort of approach to the work that they were um, they were undertaking with the different services, but also really important for our staff, frontline staff to feel well supported and to take that kind of team approach and be able to rely on people from other services um, to do good work with their client. 
Okay, so the sustainment aspects of the program in particular. So um, let's talk sessions. Um, we had, so in each of the different work streams, we um, had to think about how it was going to continue after the funding stops. We knew we only had 10 months to embed as much of this best practice as possible. So with the Let's Talk sessions, what we did is we've been running them for 10 months. Um, um, twice, a, twice a month, the um, involvement officers run these fantastic sessions. We get nothing but positive feedback on and they run the sessions around a certain topic and then they um, set up the next one and invite them all to the next one and invite all frontline staff every single time to all the um, to all the meetings. Um, and the idea was that we would need champions, so somebody from each department in each of the services to act as a champion to take on the role of facilitator in the years afterwards. So the idea is that. Um, what happened was we um, had people nominate themselves or the team leaders ended up nominating a few of their um, of their um, support staff and they were trained in how to facilitate a let's talk session and um, talk they, we talked to them about um, what topics they might want to cover and most importantly which month of the year they wanted to run their session so it's very low input in terms of resources it's one session a year that you're responsible for and the idea is that you will do your session and then you'll pass the baton on to somebody else in your service so for example if i was from cgl and um <clears throat> sorry if i was from cgl north and i took a um i decided i wanted to do june 2022 session then i would after my session i would go to somebody else in the team and i'd say you're doing june 2023 and after you've done your session you need to pass it on to someone else in our team and tell them they're doing june 2024 and so we've dropped them down to once a month um, and tried to keep it really simple it's the first tuesday of every month so whatever whatever that date falls on um that's when your session will be um, so I hope that makes sense and I've explained how we're trying to make it like a rolling program so that, that those sessions aren't ever lost. Um, if I haven't, pop it in the chat and I'll answer any questions about it. Um, okay, so that's um, how we're trying to sustain and keep those Let's Talk sessions going year on year to infinity and beyond. Um, the um, multi-agency meetings, we've trained reps um, and what we've asked them to do is just in this mo um, mobilization phase of really trying to embed the multi agency meetings, we've asked them to um, ask their colleagues in their service um, if the multi agency meetings are happening, who are attending and who aren't attending, like which of the services are kind of frequently um, not responding or not coming to the meetings and which are really, you know, doing well with coming to the multi agency meetings. Um, and then they report that information to us because it kind of help, helps us to focus on um, which services might need some more support around facilitating multi-agency meetings. Um, we also trained or offered training to all frontline staff in the No Wrong Door Network in Birmingham. Um, and so um, we've trained all the frontline staff on how to actually deliver those meetings, um, and how to set them up, um, how to um, run them, what questions to ask, how to take notes and how to um, invite everyone to the meeting and how to share those notes. Um, and we've also provided training to team leaders on specifically how to embed it. So really talking to them about um, adding it to team meeting agendas whilst we're all learning this new way of working and embedding this new approach to working with clients with multiple complex needs or um, adding it to your one-to-ones or supervisions to make sure that the person feels confident in doing it and understanding if there's any further training needs around facilitating a multi-agency meeting. Um, when we did first set up the multi-agency meetings um, in the No Wrong Door Navigator service, um, I was, as a team leader, I was a bit stumped as to why they weren't happening. Um, I talked about, I talked till I was blue in the face, as you can imagine, um, about um, about the importance of them and how, um, you know, it was um, 
best practice and how it's going to save our you know our team a lot of time in the future in terms of ringing around to find out information or who's doing what all of that sort of time saved um, if you just put the little bit of extra work in at the beginning of the client's journey um, and I couldn't really understand why they weren't happening and then um, one of my team told me he was like I've never run a meeting before Emma and it's a really scary prospect and I was like oh yeah because actually as a team leader you've probably run hundreds of meetings and it's sort of second nature and you don't really think about it um, and you don't remember or recall very easily how um, daunting the prospect was in the beginning um, especially as, as a frontline worker where you feel like um, you're constantly sort of crisis managing people and working in a really reactive way to kind of take a step back and take on some new skills um, and be expected to facilitate a meeting with your peers can be quite a scary idea. So the training really does focus on building people's confidence um, and trying to make them feel um, yeah, confident that they can run that meeting. Um, and we also offer further support. So if somebody was still struggling to run a multi-agency meeting, still struggling with their confidence or not really knowing 100% what to do, there's lots of different ways in which we will support them to try and get that confidence up so they can um, role play a team meeting with the involvement officers. They can take an actual team meeting with our team because there's only three of us, so we're not as scary as some other teams. Um, they, can, we, they can have one of the involvement officers, obviously with the consent of the client, um, run the team, um, the multi-agency meeting for them so they can actually see it in practice and get a bit, um, sort of to grips with what is expected of you when you're facilitating a multi-agency meeting. So there are all the different ways that we support people to do multi-agency meeting and trying to sort of embed that practice into um, just make it standard practice really and make it like the the thing that you do when you have a multi -age, a multiple complex needs client is have a multi-agency meeting. Um, and lastly, the workshops. Um, originally, we were going to provide the workshops to frontline staff. That makes sense. That's what we would normally do. But um, when we sat, sat back and sort of reflected on it and thought about, is that embedding practice or is that upskilling the frontline as they are right now? And then when they move on to different roles or different services, they take all that learning with them and then new people, new starters have no idea about any of that learning and it sort of gets, gets lost straight away again. So the idea is that we gave the operational leads the resources um, and we allowed them to amend them, change them, update them in line with any new legislation that comes out, any new services that come out, any reason why they might want to sort of amend those documents. They're totally their resource now um, to use. And we suggested that they use them either in best practice, kind of reflective kind of meetings, um, or specifically with an existing worker who might need some more information around certain needs, or but we also really pushed the idea that they would add them to their induction plans for new starters. So the idea is anybody coming into the services from now should have a base level understanding of all four complex needs and an overview of how to work with somebody who's got multiple complex needs. So that's really the sort of angles that we took when we were thinking about sustainment. And it was really hard job to move your brain from um, mobilizing a contract as you normally would and it's like go 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 let's get this done let's get as many you know referrals in as possible let everybody know about what we're doing blah 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 all of those kinds of normal things to do to really thinking about okay so we know the funding is ending in may what can we do to make sure that these aren't just a flash in the pan idea that everyone goes yeah brilliant great 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 for 10 months and then just goes oh where did that go um, so we really didn't want that to be the case. So we've really, really worked hard with this aspect of the programme. And it's been the biggest task because changing the way people work um, has been very, very challenging. But I'll come on to that in a bit. Um, so yeah, the Let's Talk sessions, we had to um, promote them. We had to um, de develop a contacts directory um, so that we had all the frontline staff to invite. Um, we had to um, think about timings 
um, for people, you know, some we we started off, I think it was on a Tuesday morning, and then so many people came back to us eventually and said, the reason I'm not coming is because we have our team meeting on that day, and I'm not allowed to miss it. So we had to like, change the time and to try and capture as many people as possible. Um, but also capacity. So a lot of our um, frontline staff prioritize face to face client work. That's what we've all been taught to do and um, reflecting on the work that they do or reflecting on best practice hasn't been made to feel like a priority um, for them. So um, they didn't feel like they can kind of step take that step away from the work, even for an hour. Um, so what we sort of said to them was come for as long as you want. You don't have to come to the whole session. If you get called away on urgent, an urgent call or if you've got a meeting at half past, um, you can go. You don't have to say anything. You just come for as long as you can. And that's that's all we can ask of you. Um, gaining buy in from team leaders, please release your staff to come to these Let's Talk sessions. And this is why they're so important um, was a bit of a challenge. And then um, sort of sharing things amongst your peers when there's this sort of underlying um what can only be described as competition between services so a bit of defensiveness around um oh you got a contract that we wanted or we're vying for the same contracts um, i'm not sure my team leader would be or my service manager would be so happy with me sharing this with everybody that those kinds of things um sort of being a barrier within the actual sessions themselves or fear of coming across badly to other professionals and not being willing to um, share think gaps in your knowledge or to um, reveal failings in yourself or um, talk about um, aspects of your work that are maybe below par that you need some help with and kind of asking for that help. Um, and confidentiality obviously was a big one. Who's going to know about these sessions? Who's going to hear about them? Um, am I going to get in trouble? Am I going to get reprimanded if I um, speak about something that my service didn't really want me to talk about? So the learning around from all of those challenges has been that we need a, first of all, with the um, promoting it and the contacts directory and who to invite, that was a massive task. Trying to collate everybody's information or trying to even get everyone's information took the longest time. We still don't have everybody now and um, sort of eight months in. Um, so basically, um, the idea is that we would have a fully accessible contacts directory where every professional in the network can see other people's contact details from the different services. It makes sense in terms of why, why we have to go around the houses or call um, the client helpline in order to get through to a professional. Um, things like that take so much time and take so much um, resource from other services that it just leaves the client in in not as good a position as they would be if we could just get the information we need when we need it from the person who has the information. So being really accessible and transparent with our um, contact information, especially frontline staff, is really, really important. Um, and it means that we can take a more collaborative approach. We can be more open about what it is that we're trying to do. And we can invite you to the things that we think you would want to come to. Um, so, um, but there's more challenges around that. Who would host it? So who has that document, living, breathing document that's alive? Um, and also who would be responsible for amending it. So we know that there's so much high staff turnover in this sector. Um, who's going to be able to actually go in and update it and change it? And um, what do they do if they get it wrong? Things like that. Um, the other um, learning from it is around um, having a cap on caseloads. Um, we found loads of people saying they couldn't come because they were inundated with referrals, had too many people uh, on their um, sort of caseload and were unable to spend any time thinking about the work that they do and instead had to just do the work that they've been employed to do, um, which doesn't lead to any time for reflecting on what it is you're doing right and wrong, um, which means that there'll be no sort of improvements that can happen quite quickly. Um, and no sort of sharing of best practice or anything like that. Um, but, and instead, you just find yourself repeating the same mistakes over and over and over again. 
um, with no ability to kind of step back and go, hold on a minute, what's going wrong here? What can we change? Um, fostering a culture of collaboration from the top down and from the bottom up. That's really important. If we don't instill it in our uh, frontline staff, the fact that they can share best practice and that they can talk about what, what's going wrong or what's going right for them, then we are not going to move from where we are now. We are always going to keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again or not closing up those gaps in knowledge or not closing the gaps in our services or not sort of breaking down barriers that are preventing people who really need our services from gaining our support. Um, so really trying to foster that culture from the top down, but also from the bottom up as well, just making sure that in Let's Talk sessions, people feel really confident that, you know, I can tell you what's, you know, uh, something that we need help with in our service. And it doesn't mean that we don't know what we're doing. And it doesn't mean that we should be stripped of all of our current work. It just means that actually having your input on this, in, on this problem would be really helpful. Um, and lastly, we really think it would be a good idea for Let's Talk sessions for leaders. Um, just as frontline staff didn't really have a forum before to talk about best practice or reflect on the work they do, leaders have no time to do that either. We're not encouraged to meet just to reflect on what it is that we're doing or how we could change the system. And so strategically, nothing is nothing moves forward in a sort of collaborative way. And also, um, there's not that many chances to kind of um, foster relationships between the different leaders from different services. So um, the idea would, might be to have a Let's Talk session specifically for leaders happening so that they can reflect on their practice too. Um, with the workshops, the challenges that we had, obviously attendance, um, team leaders are really busy. They didn't necessarily um, find the time to in their diaries to come to the, um, the workshops. Um, having um, sort of buy-in and capacity, like we spoke about before, it's just the same for the team leaders, feeling quite reactive rather than being able to take that step back. Um, and then ensuring the knowledge is embedded, that's been really difficult. Um, yes, I can give them the workshops, but I don't know if they're being disseminated to their um, frontline staff. I can't be confident that that's happening unless they tell me. Um, I've had a few people tell me that they are embedding them and that they are using them in that way and that they intend to use them um, at induction. So that's really great, but not everybody has sort of explained if they're, if they're going to use them or how they're going to use them. Um, staff turnover, obviously that's um, a really big problem, um, but um, so we, we're not sure if the workshops are getting given to the new starters and therefore the workshops eventually will be lost if um, they're only given to existing staff right now and then never brought up again. Um, and then the content. So it was really hard to know what level to pitch the content, con content at and also what to include. Um, you know, we are, um, I kind of consider my team as specialists in multiple complex needs because we worked um, with, you know, with so many multiple complex needs clients over the years and um, we bring all of that experience with us. But when it comes to home, homelessness and housing, substance misuse, you know, the particular um, different strands of multiple complex needs, it would have been really helpful to have had people who specialize in those areas collaborating with us on those um, workshops so um thinking about maybe having um somebody from cgl collaborating with us to do the um the substance misuse one or someone from mine doing the mental health one with us and um, the reason i say with us is because i really felt like it was important to make sure that there was sort of layman involved in what was going on as well because we needed to know what the bare minimum of um information was we didn't want all this high level technical sort of jargon coming into the, the workshop we wanted it to be very practical and, and useful to the frontline staff um so that was some, some of the learning and the other parts of the learning were um expectation of commissioners and each other so um is the is this what is expected um are we expected to learn all of this information and if not are we going to really spend time learning this information probably not um, changing the culture again and the idea about taking a step back and learning and reflecting on our practice isn't really encouraged. 
um, and collaborating with people with lived experience. We did that on these workshops and it was the most useful part of the workshops, I think, because um, it was people telling us their experience of working with services, um, of being a client in services and what they wish that worker would have known. Um, so things that we would never have thought of it unless you've been through those services yourself. Um, and that was so important in what we did. Um, and lastly, just a um, closer look at multi-agency meetings. So these have been the most difficult things to kind of embed because I suppose it's maybe the biggest departure from, from how we work normally. Um, there are some agencies that do um, take this approach and do call meetings with lots of different individuals, but there's nobody doing it kind of formally um, and nobody doing it um, consistently. So the idea was that, um, you know, anyone who's got multiple complex needs would have a multi agency meeting. Um, so we wanted, um, we, first of all, the trick was getting everyone to buy into the idea, really helping staff to understand this is going to save future you lots of time instead of ringing around lots of different numbers or sitting in, um, in a call queue for half a day, you're going to have met that person, have their direct line, um, have an in with them and know what they're about and what they're, what they're actually providing the client with. Um, and for team leaders or service managers, it was around talking about, um, you know, this will help relieve stress from your team. This me means that their workload is in essence reduced because they're not trying to meet all of the different needs. They're just doing the work that they specialize in, which frees up their time to work with their other clients. It means that the burden doesn't all lay on your service um, and it frees them up to actually do the work that you've been you're being paid to do um so that was another way of helping people to buy into it um and just also mainly looking at the client outcomes um that we had when we did the multi-agency meetings and the feedback that we had from staff when they took part in the multi-agency meetings being so positive um and how it can really raise the quality of the work that you're doing um, when you collaborate in that way um the initial time and resources feels intense um obviously setting up a meeting calling everyone to the meeting getting knockbacks from people people just not responding to you and then actually holding a meeting that feels resource intensive to begin with but like i said it's meant to save you time lots of time in the long run and the more that you do it the quicker and easier it is um embedding it has been a problem um, the multi-agency meeting reps are brilliant. They've really um, sort of on board with the idea. Everyone's on board with the idea. Everyone thinks it's a great idea by all accounts. However, actually changing the way that you do things is another story and is much more difficult to do than I think people realise. Um, the multi-agency meeting reps had an unforeseen pro problem in that um, they were contacting their um, other members in the team and they weren't getting responses from other members in the team. So it's not just us contacting them being like, please, can you give us some information about multi-agency meetings that have happened in your service and them not responding? It's not even the case that that's happening. It's um, even more grassroots than that. And actually the other colleagues in their team are not responding to their calls for that information. Um, so it's been really hard to know whether they're happening and if they're not happening, why they're not happening so that we can sort of support them to overcome any challenges that they're facing. Other services are a big problem. This will multi agency meetings work only if multi agencies get involved. So you can't have a multi agency meeting on your own. You can't really have one with one other service. You need all the services involved to be coming regularly to those meetings or to be making space in their diary or in their minds for the idea of having a multi-agency meeting. If other services don't do it, then you can't do it successfully yourself. So it really does take everybody investing in it um, and everybody taking responsibility to make these happen for it to work. Um, and then lastly, capacity and workload prioritizing again, we on the front line, we tend to prioritize that actual client contact because that is what we get monitored on. That's what our team leaders ask us about. Um, they don't tend to ask us about, have you had a multi-agency meeting? They tend to ask us, 
when did you last see the client? How were they? What did you do? Um, so it's kind of changing that perspective. Um, so some of the learning was that even when everyone agrees that this is a better way of working, there will still be some very difficult challenges ahead in actually embedding new practice and helping people to sort of change their perspective or change their way of working. It's a very laborious and um, time taking task. Um, and then tabling these ideas during inductions means people are more likely um, to have this come, become habituated. So with the new starters, it's been much easier because we can just say to them, this is how we do it with multiple complex needs clients. And they seem to pick that up really quickly and, and implement it really quickly. And it just becomes part of the way that they work. Um, whereas somebody who's been working in a different way for a really long amount of time, um, it's much harder to sort of undo that and unpick that with them and get them to see that this way might be an easier way of working. Um, so the legacy of the No Wrong Door Sustainment Programme. So we want the Let's Talk sessions um, to um, keep going forever and ever. Um, so um, the invites will be sent for June's um, quite shortly. Um, and so you'll see, um, you'll see who's going to do the next one. Um, and um, if you want to be on the mailing list and aren't on the mailing list and you're a frontline worker and you're thinking, I don't ever get invited to them, just let me know and we'll put you on the mailing list and then you will get the invites as well. Um, the, um, if you haven't received the workshops from your operational lead, please request them from them. So if you're a frontline worker and you're thinking, I've never seen these workshops, they'd be really handy, ask your operational lead. And if they don't have them, they can ask me for them and I will send them the workshops. Um, Multi-agency meetings hopefully will become standard practice and the expectation of all support services. So we want all support services to be like, you've got multiple complex needs client, where's your multi-agency meeting? Please have this done by the next time we talk. Um, and we want it to be a standard practice because we know that multiple complex needs clients work best when they've got that team of people working really collaboratively around them. Um, but we also kind of want the funders to expect that. We want commissioners to start writing that into their contracts so that we work more collaboratively. Um, the last thing that we're going to do is we're going to upload an impact report. Um, it's going to be on the BVSC website and it will include the full consort of recommendations. So I'll touch on a few now of the recommendations, but, um, but you can get all of the whole list of all of them. There's quite a few um, in the impact report and it will be on BVSC's website. And we're hoping that commissioners will consider all the areas of best practice that we've spoken about, along with the um, recommendations and integrate them into future activities and ideas um, in future contracts. So some of the key recommendations are um, having an accessible contacts directory, which I've spoken a lot about, um, having Let's Talk sessions for senior leaders, which I've spoken about, um, and, um, and one that I've not really touched on is having multiple complex needs workshops, um, given out, yes, given out to all support services in Birmingham, but also maybe um, multiple complex needs workshops being given to services that come into contact with um, people who've got multiple complex needs frequently, but aren't necessarily classed as support services. So the police um, or DWP, um, or GPs, um, places like that, where they just have an understanding of what it takes to work with somebody who's got multiple complex needs and how having multiple complex needs might affect their engagement in those services. Um, the last one is around um, workshop, um, is around multi-agency meetings, and I've just put, they should happen. Um, so what we're hoping for um, is, um, key recommendation is that multiple um, multi-agency meetings become common practice. Um, we need them to be added to team meeting agendas, one-to-one -one templates and case reviews, and be the expectation that your service um, sets for your frontline staff. And then we need a periodic review of multi-agency meetings are they happening? If not, why not? And then some general recommendations, just this is the last slide, um, is some frontline staff representation at systems change meeting opportunities. Our frontline staff have a wealth of information and really know how and if things will work on the ground um, with our actual clients. It's really important when we're talking about anything to do with systems change or any 
um, really anything strategic, massive changes, um, having frontline staff representation at that meetings um, should at those meetings should be a given. Um, why are we not tapping into that wealth of knowledge? Why are we not tapping into those expertise? And why are we not thinking about the really practical implement um, implications of implementing some of these ideas that we come up with um, at a more senior level? Um, a barrier escalation system should be established where staff can raise issues or concerns directly with senior managers and commissioners. So where we're hearing about challenges in certain specific areas, it would be great if we had a hotline to tell people about what it is that we're seeing. Um, everyone should have the opportunity to complain or, um, or raise any issues or areas of concern. Um, with people who can actually make changes to the barrier that they're seeing. Um, and lastly, sustainability should be built into contracts. So rather than us thinking about um, doing, doing the work for the amount of time that we have the contract and not really thinking beyond that, it would be really helpful, I think, for every, like for all the other staff in different um, services to know that these initiatives are being started but they're not necessarily going to end and here is the plan for making sure that they don't end um because historically we've seen really good ideas coming through and that everybody agrees with are great ideas and that they want to do them and then um the service ends or the program ends those ideas go away again and everyone is left feeling quite disheartened or sort of disillusioned about um investing in other new activities going forwards. So building that sustainability and right from sort of mobilization phase would be a really good idea, we think. Um, so that's the end of the presentation. Um, I have no idea what time it is. I just know I've spoken for a really long time. Um, and so um, that's what, who you contact if you've got any questions. Um, are there any questions in the chat? And Jan, what time is it? Three minutes to Emma, that's absolutely perfect timing. No questions in the chat as yet. So uh, we'll see if anybody's open to any questions now, I guess. Just looking quite quiet. I guess- that was uh, stunned silence, sorry everyone. <laughs> I guess just to let everybody know that the Birmingham Changing Futures Together website has a whole sort of no wrong door navigator and neuron door resources web page on there so it's worth going on to our the changing futures together web page there's loads of learning as emma mentioned earlier we'll put on the full report that she'll be writing with the recommendation stuff so that's on there the report into the navigators is on there so there's loads on there if anything does crop up after um we finish this 